Discord to the cloud. All right. Well, once again, welcome everybody that is here today. My name is David Garby. Uh, feel free to call me Dr. Dave if you want. I am the Director of Outreach and Education for the Pennsylvania Society for Biomedical Research. And we are uh, originally partnered with Gateway High School in New Jersey to uh, provide an internship type experience where we're inviting guest presenters within the biomedical science community to come in and tell us about their careers and their, their professional journeys. Um, we've opened it up to other schools as well. So again, if you, this is your first time, welcome and thank you for joining us. Uh, I'm gonna just quickly give a brief introduction to Dr. Christy Shuda McGuire, um, who I've known now for quite a long time, quite a number of years, and we overlap each other quite a bit within the STEM community in Philadelphia. Uh, Dr. McGuire, Dr. Shuda McGuire is currently Associate Dean for Biomedical Studies and an Associate Professor at the Wistar Institute in Philadelphia. Uh, before joining Wistar, Wistar, excuse me, she was a, an Assistant Dean in the College of Science and Mathematics School of Health Professions at Rowan University. Uh, and then prior to that, which is actually where I first, I remember our first conversation that I had with Christy, um, it, she was uh, an associate professor in the biology department at the Community College of Philadelphia. And I think this is probably what led her to her position today. She was also from 2013 to 2018, she served as the academic coordinator for Wistar's biotechnician training program, which is now a state certified apprenticeship program. I'm sure she'll be telling you more about that today. Um, that's out of Wistar Institute, and that's in collaboration with the Community College of Philadelphia. Uh, she holds a master's degree in science of instruction from Drexel University and a PhD in genetics from Thomas Jefferson University. So Philly born and raised, or at least been here for quite a while. Uh, so I'm going to turn the mic over to Dr. Christy Shuda McGuire, and I want to thank her again for joining us and giving up her time to present to our students. Thanks, Christy. Thanks, Dave. And yes, Philly born, but um, South Jersey raised. So that's why um, uh, hello to my friends over at uh, Gateway High School. Um, so um, my plan today is uh, uh, to do some introductions and talk to you about my own career path and then um, the career path that has led me to my current position at the Wistar Institute. So I'll tell you a little bit more about Wistar as well as as our education and training programs. And then since it's still such a hot topic and on everybody's mind, um, we'll talk a little bit about the uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, COVID research we have um, going on at uh, the Wistar Institute. So I would love to hear who I have in the audience today. Um, so, um, uh, you know, I don't wanna call on people, but if you are willing, um, please unmute and tell me your name uh, and grade and where you go to school and what you think you might wanna do in your future career. Before we do that, Christy, I uh, love the student participation. I just wanna let you know that we are seeing your uh, speaker notes as well. So I don't know if you oh, wanna start your, your slide presentation um, if that's the way you were gonna run it, that's all. Perfect, how okay. about now? You're good? Uh, no, I still see slide present. Uh, I still see your your notes. This is different than when we tested it five minutes ago. <laughs> we jinxed ourselves saying that we we were Zoom pros. How about I guess now? Yes, we did. Nope. Still see your. Right, I mean, it's. A, um, I don't um, know what your speaker notes say, so I wanted to make sure that if right. you did not want to show them, you are not. All right. So let's see. How about now? Anything? No, can you maybe X out sharing your screen and then reshare it? I think it, it might just be stuck. I'm not sure. Okay. And whilst, while we're figuring this out, um, students, uh, I encourage you to find your unmute button. There we go. Now I can see just your slides. Find your unmute right, button. Perfect. <laughs> and chime in. Uh, so... I'm Anika Reddy Chapopoli. Um, I'm a freshman at Northern Burlington Regional High School. And um, as for a career path, I am looking to uh, go into the biomedical field. And as of now, I'm thinking of either oncology or psychiatry. So Great, go. thanks Anika. Uh, I'm D D D D Diego Asensio. 
Uh, I'm a junior at Pensbury High School in the Fairless Hills area, around Philly, more PA side. Um, and in the future, I think I want to be a pediatrician. Great. Thanks, Diego. That's actually what I thought I was going to be um, when I was in uh, high school as well. Uh, Chris, we do have two um, uh, attendees, participants chiming in via text. Their, their mics don't work very well. Um, okay. One student's name is Tori Mickles. Um, she's a senior at Gateway Regional High School, and she plans on majoring in nursing at the University of Delaware. And the other student is Hannah. Um, she is also a senior at Gateway High School and is going to college as a nursing major and a soccer player. Great, welcome Victoria and Hannah. And uh, Hannah, thanks for sharing that. I have a uh, 10 year old daughter who is also a soccer player. Anybody else wanna unmute? Hi, my name is Becca. I am a senior at Gateway Regional High School and I have committed to Rowan University and majoring in elementary education. Great. I was actually over at Rowan on Sunday. Um, even though I, I no longer work there, I was uh, using my connections to give my cousin uh, a tour of the campus. Um, and I think she will be uh, transferring there in the fall. Um, hi, I'm Bishnavi Batsal, and I'm a freshman at uh, Spring Ford Ninth Grade Center, as you can probably tell by the name. Um, and I'm not entirely sure what I want to do yet, but I do know I want to go into like research and the biomedical field. So. Great, Vishnavi. Thanks for joining. My name, my name is Rachel Kilmer, and um, I'm a freshman at Council Rock High School South, and I'm not sure what I want to go into yet, but probably something in terms of STEM. Great, Rachel. Thanks for joining. Anybody else? Anybody want to put anything in the chat? Um, I'm the career facilitator for Gateway, Christy, and I just want to say thank you so much for being here. It's invaluable for our students to hear directly from people working in the field, and, and David's been phenomenal in making these connections happen. So thank you for all the work that you do, and thank you for your time sharing that with our students. Uh, th thanks for having me, Melissa, and yes, um, uh, special thanks um, to, to David, who always uh, makes sure, even when those emails fall to the bottom of the um, uh, email account that he uh, he follows up. So I'm happy to be able to to do this for you guys today. Thanks. All we right. also had a, uh, okay. so, sorry, another, we had another student chime in via the text box. Uh, Susanna is a freshman at I don't even, I stink at pronouncing names. Tom and End uh, Middle School. She said maybe high school. Uh, I'm not sure what I want to do yet, but most probably science related. So it seems like there's a lot of people interested in the science. Bio, uh, biology, healthcare field. So this is the right place to be for everybody. Um, I did wanna just say one more thing uh, as a reminder, in case you came on late, that this session is being recorded. Um, therefore, I believe it records the active window uh, in most cases. So if you do not want your face to be recorded on this webinar, you can turn off your camera when it's time for you to speak, but we do encourage your face um, you to turn on your camera when you're not speaking so everybody can can see each other. Um, and I should mention also, since we have a lot of new participants on the call today that we try to record all of these and they are most likely going to be, or a few of them are already up on our YouTube page. And my goal was to put all of these webinars up on our YouTube page. So you can always go back and rewatch or watch for the first time uh, any other presenter that we've done over the past, I don't know, five or six weeks uh, that you might want to learn more from as well. So if you're interested, you can feel free to reach out to me and I can provide you with our YouTube channel um, and you can watch a bunch of other webinars in your spare time. All right. Thanks, Christy. All right. Thanks, Dr. Dave. All right. So a little bit about myself. Um, as uh, uh, Dave said, I was born in Philadelphia. Um, my father actually worked for the uh, Philadelphia refinery that is now um, closed down. Um, but we moved uh, to New Jersey when it was time for me to go to school. So I uh, went to school in uh, South Jersey. First, we lived in Gloucester Township and then um, moved to Haddon Township. Um, as a child, I was really involved in uh, gymnastics. 
Um, I was also a, a good student. I especially liked uh, math and science. Um, I extracted onion DNA as a senior in my AP biology course. And, um, you know, that was one of the things that, um, you know, I still uh, have and actually talk about as leading me down to a, uh, a career path in science. Um, but at the time, because I liked math and science, um, I thought it, I wanted to become a doctor, right? Maybe a pediatrician, because that was um, the doctor that I had the most uh, experience with of having seen myself. Um, but again, with the experiments like uh, what we were doing in AP biology, I found I was more interested in why questions. Um, and then I also figured out that I don't really like to be around sick people. So I wouldn't have minded those uh, well checkups, but um, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm a little bit of a germaphobe. So I, I, I didn't think that um, medicine was the right path for me. Um, so I went to Loyola College, uh, now Loyola University in Baltimore, Maryland. Um, I majored in biology and I also participated in the honors program. Um, I worked as a tutor for um, uh, the biology course because I had taken AP biology. I found the freshman biology course um, pretty easy. So I was a tutor for that course um, and that actually led me to, um, by my senior year, becoming the tutor coordinator for um, all of Loyola uh, students in STEM courses. Um, another experience I had as a, an undergraduate student at Loyola was as a resident assistant. Um, and so resident assistants um, live in uh, student housing um, and help to do um, some uh, programming, both educational and social programming. And I really liked that position. Um, during my summers, uh, one summer I had the opportunity to participate in undergraduate research um, on carrot embryogenesis. So although, you know, this is what you might think of with a carrot, I was really um, working with uh, uh, cells, doing plant cell culture, which turned out to be a, um, a great skill to have in science. Um, and then um, uh, two other summers, I worked for um, Johns Hopkins University Center for Talented Youth summer programs. Um, one summer as a lab assistant um, for a course called How to Be a Scientist. Um, and uh, another summer as a teaching assistant for a uh, mathematical reasoning course. So from those um, experiences, I knew that I wanted to um, teach science, but I still wasn't sure of exactly what level I was going to end up um, teaching. So um, because I uh, was a science major, I didn't really have the opportunity to do any um, student teaching at Loyola or earn my um, teaching certification. So I started a master's program, um, as Dave said, in the science of instruction at Drexel University, came back to Philadelphia, um, and I was taking uh, my education courses at night. Um, and during the day, I found a position as a research assistant in a genetics lab at what was then Medical College of Pennsylvania Hahnemann University and is now um, Drexel University College of Medicine. So I was working in um, the lab during the day doing some really cool research on um, mutations that uh, cause human disease. Um, and then I was taking these uh, education courses um, in the evening. And I found that I was enjoying the research much more than the education courses. So my roommate from Loyola had gone right from Loyola into a PhD program in biochemistry at Thomas Jefferson University. And so she knew I um, was really liking the genetics research more than I had ever liked the undergraduate research on uh, carrot embryos. And so she um, recruited me and I started a PhD program um, the following year at uh, Jefferson. So my research was mainly on um, uh, female meiosis using um, mouse oocytes, right? So how um, women produce, um, you know, their eggs that are then fertilized and lead to a healthy child. So again, kind of picking up on that original interest in, um, in pediatrics, right? And uh, healthy children. Um, that's what I was looking at, the, uh, the reproductive process um, to make a healthy child. I was also really active in our um, graduate student association. Um, and actually, I just spoke to some graduate students um, at Jefferson last week and some of the events that they still do uh, for graduate students. Um, I actually started when I was uh, a graduate student at uh, Jefferson. 
So um, I really love Jefferson, but my advisor um, uh, moved our lab down to Johns Hopkins University, um, which didn't seem like a bad thing because I had been in Baltimore for um, my undergraduate. So um, we went back down to Baltimore. Um, I also had the opportunity to uh, this time teach my own courses, my own summer courses for Johns Hopkins University CTY while we were in Baltimore. Um, but then my advisor decided that he was going to move the lab again, um, this time across the country to the University of California, um, Irvine. Um, but I decided to return to Philadelphia and finish my thesis research with a collaborator at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, while I was uh, finishing that research at Penn, I got my um, first uh, real job, as you might call it, as director of the Penn Summer Science Academy in biomedical research. Um, but that was only a summer position, so I knew I had to find uh, something uh, after the summer, come September, and uh, that position ended up being a full-time faculty member at Community College of Philadelphia. Um, where I was for 11 years. So because I hadn't finished my um, PhD when I started uh, the faculty position, I started at Community College of Philadelphia as an instructor um, and then uh, was promoted to an assistant professor and then um, an associate professor. Um, while I was there, I got to teach uh, general biology courses, um, anatomy and physiology one and two. Um, genetics, which, you know, for my background was one of my um, favorite courses to teach. Um, I also developed a forensic biology course for um, our students in the justice and paralegal programs at Community College of Philadelphia. Um, and I taught a, a, a freshman orientation seminar, um, kind of a how to be a, a college student type course. Um, as Dave mentioned, I also became the coordinator of uh, the biomedical technician training program which uh, is a partnership between Community College of Philadelphia and the Wistar Institute that I'll tell you more about. Um, I was really involved in our faculty center for teaching and learning. Um, and then I also started teaching at my alma mater um, at uh, Jefferson after finishing my PhD. So uh, I still have an adjunct faculty position at Jefferson, which means um, I teach uh, part-time at Jefferson. Um, so after being at Community College of Philadelphia for 11 years, I decided I wanted to take the leap into administration. Um, and I took a, a position as assistant dean in the College of Science and Math and School of Health Professions at Rowan University. Um, interesting story talking about um, connections and um, using your network. Um, I knew about the position at Rowan because of a uh, uh, the parent of a um, friend of my daughter's uh, they were in their kindergarten class together, and he told me that the position was opening up. Um, but I only spent um, uh, a little under two years at Rowan, and I was recruited back to Wistar to be the uh, Associate Dean for Biomedical Studies, and that's where I am now. So um, the Wistar Institute is our nation's first independent biomedical research institute. Um, we're located on the campus of the University of Pennsylvania, but we are um, uh, an independent nonprofit uh, institution. Um, we're named after Dr. Casper Wistar, who was a renowned physician, uh, anatomist, and teacher at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, and he was really known for his collection of anatomical models that he used um, to teach his medical students. Um, including some constructed by the famous uh, American sculptor, William Rush. Uh, his great nephew, Isaac Jones Wistar, founded the Wistar Institute of Anatomy and Biology to house his great uncle's collection of those teaching models, um, and then also to initiate any other work for the increase of original scientific knowledge. So um, this is uh, the Wistar Institute today. This is uh, Spruce Street and um, uh, 36th. So this is the original building um, built in 1894. Uh, Wistar was founded in um, 1892, but this building was completed in 1894. Um, and then we put uh, a cancer center addition on in 1974. And then our uh, research tower was added in 2014. So I have a little... Um, history video about Wistar. I'm going to try to stop share and then reshare to show you guys this.
to discover, means to make known, to obtain knowledge of for the first time. A cure, a means of healing or restoring health. Two powerful words that have guided Wistar's researchers for generations. But where did it start? How did we get here? It begins in 1892. The Wistar Institute of Anatomy and Biology is founded. Named after Dr. Casper Wistar, a well-respected Philadelphia physician and educator, Wistar was founded by General Isaac Jones Wistar, the great nephew of Dr. Casper Wistar. The Wistar Institute is America's first independent, non-profit biomedical research institute. Wistar was a totally new concept where biologists could uh, come together and work together for research and discoveries. From the very beginning, the Institute sought to move research advances from the laboratory to the clinic as quickly as possible. At the turn of the 20th century, Helen Dean King, Wistar's first female scientist, bred the Wistar rat, the first standardized lab animal from which more than half of all laboratory rats today descended. Helen Dean King was one of a handful of women working at the time, let alone in science. Her work helped pave the way for Wistar's ongoing successes in cutting-edge research. The Institute also gained international recognition as a training ground for young scientists, thanks to the scientific journals published by the Wistar Press. During World War I, when most of Europe was unable to print or purchase scientific publications, the Wistar Press distributed thousands of free journals throughout the scientific community. The 1960s saw Wistar at the forefront in the development of a vaccine against rubella. It is a Wistar vaccine that is credited with eliminating the threat posed by rubella to infants in the United States. A rabies vaccine followed, much improved from the Louis Pasteur vaccine that was extremely painful and required multiple shots. It was the Wistar discoveries that led to the vaccine for rubella and in the process for the vaccine against rabies. In 1971, President Richard Nixon declared a war on cancer, and thus, cancer research became a national priority. Everything that can be done by government, everything that can be done by voluntary agencies in this great, powerful, rich country now will be done. A year later, Wistar was the first in the nation to earn the distinction of National Cancer Institute designated Cancer Center in Basic Research. The NCI designation instilled public support and critical funding, allowing us to focus solely on research. Wistar's researchers have remained at the forefront of cancer biology, studying genes and cell biology associated with breast, skin, lung, prostate, and ovarian cancers, as well as immunology, infectious diseases, and virology. Wistar scientists were among the first to develop monoclonal antibodies, able to detect and destroy foreign invaders and cancer cells. Starting in 1980, scientists at Wistar and Children's Hospital of Philadelphia collaborated with Merck to develop a vaccine against rotavirus, the leading cause of severe diarrhea and vomiting in infants and young children worldwide, which once caused more than 200,000 hospital visits in the US and hundreds of thousands of deaths around the world each year. The Rotatech vaccine, approved in 2006 and introduced as part of the recommended immunization schedule for infants in the US, has dramatically improved children's health worldwide. Wistar researchers launched the largest clinical trial for HIV and are collaborating with partners on DNA vaccines for Zika virus and other emerging infectious diseases. Wistar's impact on biomedical research locally and globally has been immeasurable. The possibilities created by our science at Wistar are amazing. In 2014, the opening of the Robert and Penny Fox Tower expanded Wistar's lab space, allowing more top scientific talent to make more advancements, to build on our history, which extends across generations of researchers, focused solely on our mission of research, discovery, and cures. The Wistar Institute. Scientific discoveries. Medical breakthroughs.
All right, so I hope that taught you a little bit about Wistar. The other link um, that I had on that last slide, I'm just going to uh, uh, show you, but you can go to the Wistar Institute's website, and I'll put the link in the chat. Um, and we have a really cool uh, interactive timeline um, where you can scroll through and um, you know see some of those events and more uh, that have uh, happened in the history of science at Wistar. Um, I've actually joked with David before, I think I could teach a history of science course just um, uh, using discoveries and how the technology has progressed um, at, at Wistar. So maybe someday we'll, uh, we'll offer that. All right, so I'm going to reshare. All right. Dave, am I okay? Can you see the PowerPoint? Yep, all good. Okay, great. All right, so especially since some of you said that you were interested um, in biomedical uh, research, going into biomedical research as a career, um, I wanted to tell you that biomedical research laboratories are headed by uh, a principal investigator or a PI um, who leads and funds the research, mainly through government and foundation grants. Um, in the lab, there may be uh, laboratory technicians or research assistants, and these terms are used um, interchangeably at different institutions and um, with different levels of education. Um, students, so at WISTAR, we have um, programs for students from um, high school to graduate school. Uh, postdoctoral fellows who are um, uh, students who have received their PhD, but are still doing um, training, um, usually leading to uh, their next position um, as maybe a senior scientist or as a principal investigator themselves. Um, and then um, we have visiting scientists from actually all over the world at uh, Wistar. It's, it's really interesting. We always tell people when you walk around um, during lunchtime, um, the smells from all the uh, uh, lunches from um, the cuisine, international cuisine is, is really great. So our uh, education and training programs that I mentioned, um, we have had a high school fellowship program, um, predominantly for students in the school district of Philadelphia since 1994. Um, but we also try to do uh, outreach events like this one um, or um, you know, pre-pandemic and again, post-pandemic uh, have hosted uh, groups of middle school and high school students at the Wistar Institute. Um, our signature program um, is the Biomedical Technician Training Program. Um, I'll talk more about that in partnership with Community College of Philadelphia. Um, we also partner with LaSalle University to teach a course called Life Science Innovations. Um, this year, we started a new program with Cheney University, which combines um, some of the uh, hands-on training from the Biomedical Technician Training Program um, with the uh, Life Science Innovations um, training. Um, and uh, uh, the BTT program and the Cheney program can both lead to uh, our biomedical research technician um, apprenticeship, which as Dave mentioned was registered with the state of Pennsylvania. Um, and then we have um, graduate students at Wistar from both the University of Pennsylvania um, and then a new program um, with the University of Bologna, which is in Italy, but it's the world's uh, oldest university. So students um, from those uh, universities come to Wistar to complete their thesis work with our scientists. We have our own uh, PhD program in cancer biology in partnership with the University of the Sciences. Um, and then I have uh, mentioned our postdoctoral fellows. And at any given time, we have about um, uh, 50 postdoctoral fellows, um, again, um, from uh, all over the world working at Wistar. So I encourage you, I will uh, put this in the chat to our link to check out more about our education and training programs. Okay, so as I said, it, since I was involved from the community college side, um, and also now the WISTAR side, I wanted to talk to you about our biomedical technician training program, which um, has been around since um, 2000 as a partnership between Community College of Philadelphia, which provides the educational foundation, and the WISTAR Institute, 
who along with affiliated universities, um, other research institutes and area biotechnology companies provide the uh, practical laboratory training and experiences for students. So I'm gonna stop my share for a second and show you guys uh, another video that we created. Medical research industry grows rapidly in Philadelphia. So does the need for a skilled research technician workforce. Since 2000, the Wistar Institute has opened its doors to students, providing a level of training that allows them to make immediate contributions to biomedical research and pursue long term careers in the life sciences. Over 150 community college students have embarked on new and exciting careers through Wistar's Biomedical Technician Training Program, launched by Dr. William Wunner. This paid experience offers hands-on laboratory and classroom training over two summers. The knowledge and skills developed during this time allow students to quickly embrace their new identity as scientists. This program has opened so many doors for me. I have the opportunity leaving the BTT program to become a integral member of science here at Wistar or at any biomedical institution. BTT has opened up a whole new career path that I would have never known was there had you talked to me as an undergraduate. And I've met professionals in the field that now that I've built my skills and have gone through the BTT, they would trust that I can run the experiments and they would be happy to hire me. I feel like it's really solidified my opportunities in the world of science. The Worcester Institute is a world-renowned biomedical research facility, so it's really cool to be a part of that. Being able to say that I've done this type of research at this type of institution makes me a way more competitive applicant. While many students continue on to four-year colleges, others choose to continue on-the-job training through Wistar's Biomedical Research Technician Apprenticeship, the nation's first-of-its-kind state-registered non-traditional apprenticeship launched in 2017. Students carry out real-world lab research in the fields of cancer and infectious diseases. I went from being an artist to being a scientist. So the idea that I can start something new in my 40s, that's super awesome to me. And it just sort of has given me confidence. Here at the BRT program, you're paired up with someone who's your mentor and they spend time with you, show you how to do the experiments on a one-to-one -one basis. And basically that sort of one-on-one -on -one attention is at the core of the program and really helped me to learn. I feel like I'm a successful part of the team in the laboratory today because of them. Wistar's BTT program and BRT apprenticeship prepares each individual to walk with confidence through the doors of research facilities around the region and beyond with the skills and knowledge needed to become biomedical scientists of the future. I am an artist. I am a musician. I am a business owner. I am a cosmetologist. I am a community college of Philadelphia graduate. We are scientists. So I always like looking at that. So since they are um, some of my former students in that video, it's always fun. Um, I'm going to share my PowerPoint again. All right. How am I doing, Dave? Is it back to the right screen? You are good to go. All right. So um, over the last 20 years, um, our biomedical technician training program um, has had 160 students, uh, over 160 now, 164 complete the program. 46% um, who have gone on to obtain uh, positions in laboratories within a year. Um, but 64% who have continued their education going beyond the community college um, to earn a bachelor's, master's, um, and PharmD and PhD degrees. So you can see that 46 and 64% don't add up to 100, right? They add more up to more than 100%. And that's because one of the things I love about this program is it enables students to do both. Um, to find a position in the field that they want to go into while um, continuing their education. Um, so 72% uh, of our students have completed 
the BTT program, including 52% uh, from underrepresented backgrounds and 71% um, uh, women. So um, even though this isn't 100%, we always uh, would like it to be 100%. Everybody we accept into the program, we would like to um, finish. Um, and so uh, we uh, had two things happen um, in 2020. One, as you all know, the pandemic um, actually uh, forced us to um, not be able to start a new cohort in 2020. Um, but to think about um, you know, where we wanted to take the program in the future. And one of the things we noticed that of the um, individuals, of the 28% of individuals who didn't finish the program, um, sometimes it was for a good reason, because after just one summer in our program, they were able to um, either transfer uh, institutions um, and or um, obtain a position. So we thought, well, maybe one summer is enough. And so maybe these students who we wanted to start in the program um, in uh, May of 2020 might be able to still finish when they expected to um, in August of 2021. So this year we are piloting um, a new 14-week uh, BTT program. Um, so we're going to have an orientation where we work with students in our um, brand new training lab at WISTAR. Um, and then students are going to do two laboratory experiences, six weeks in an academic lab and six weeks in an industry lab. And one of the best things about our program is that um, although students um, uh, pay tuition to Community College of Philadelphia for prerequisite courses, um, they don't pay anything for our program. And in fact, um, we have funding at Wistar to be able to um, uh, pay the students $10 an hour um, during this training. Um, one of the reasons we also want to give students experience in um, industry is because Philadelphia um, and the greater Philadelphia area, for those of you not in the city, really has a booming um, biomedical and biotechnology uh, industry. So um, we used to be known as uh, Med and Ed um, because we have nearly 100 colleges and universities in the greater Philadelphia region. And one out of every six doctors actually receives part of their education and training in Philadelphia. Um, and then Philadelphia also ranks third in the United States for the amount of um, National Institutes of Health or NIH funding it receives. Um, more recently, uh, some people may have heard the term Silicon Valley, and that's because we now have more than 30 gene and cell therapy companies. Um, Philadelphia is the home um, to uh, gene and cell therapy. Um, and 85% of all pharmaceutical and biotechnology companies, even if their headquarters are somewhere else, um, they have locations in the greater Philadelphia region. There's also a lot of new laboratory facilities in the city, um, you know, including that research tower at Wistar, um, lots of uh, new buildings, research buildings at um, the University of Pennsylvania, Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, um, the University City Science Center, um, Schuylkill Yards, and uh, the Navy Yard. So in um, 2017, we decided to extend our biomedical technician training program um, with the Biomedical Research Technician uh, Apprenticeship, um, or BRT program, um, which was the first ever registered non-traditional biomedical research apprenticeship recognized by um, Pennsylvania Department of Labor and Industry. And um, this offers an additional nine months of specialized on-the-job training um, with salary support to incentivize employers to um, hire graduates of our biomedical technician training program. So once we uh, developed and registered the BRT apprenticeship, we were able to register the biomedical technician training program as a pre-apprenticeship. And so together, the BTT pre-apprenticeship and the BRT apprenticeship provide 2,000 hours of on-the-job training um, and 144 hours of related technical instruction um, to our students. And for this, we were awarded the 2019 uh, Outstanding Non-Traditional Apprenticeship Program. Um, apprenticeships have been used um, for many years in uh, the trades and manufacturing, um, but we're really trying to expand this model um, into non-traditional careers like biomedical research. And um, since some people um, spoke about uh, in having an interest in medicine or nursing, some other healthcare um, programs also have um, apprenticeships attached now. So um, a, another one of my former students uh, is finishing the Biomedical Research Technician Apprenticeship Program. Um, and this connects perfectly to our COVID-19 
research at Wistar because he has had the opportunity to contribute to that um, COVID-19 uh, research, specifically um, the development of uh, a DNA vaccine. So I'm going to stop sharing again and um, try to show you this great action news clip on um, Yaya Dia. Tonight, Action News is Philly proud of a young man who finds himself on the front lines of the battle to develop a coronavirus vaccine. His presence there is a testament to his smarts and his drive. He has come a long way. Community journalist Ashley Johnson tells the story. Inside this lab at the prestigious Worcester Institute in Philadelphia, Yaya Dia, an immigrant from West Africa, is working tirelessly to create a vaccination for COVID-19. It's a privilege working with, uh, you know, top scientists within uh, the Weiner lab and especially being there and being able to contribute. While his drive to help others during such a critical time speaks volumes, so does his personal journey. He came to Philadelphia from Burkina Faso at the age of nine speaking no English. When I continued with high school, uh, I had that mentality to be number one. He went on to study business at Philadelphia Community College, but happened to take a biology course which spoke to his heart. It was his bio professor at CCP who encouraged Dia to apply to Worcester. When I started the program, I didn't think that I would be working with COVID. The coronavirus was a wake-up call for Dia to pursue his dreams. He's now an apprentice at Worcester Institute, helping to study a vaccine developed by Anovia Pharmaceuticals based in Plymouth Meeting. Nearly 40 vaccines are in the works at different stages, and lab techs like Dia serve a crucial role. People all, all, all over the world would be able to benefit from this uh, DNA vaccine, so that's the goal. My ultimate goal... Uh, as always, is to be a philanthropist. Dia hopes to be an inspiration to others, especially given the fact that minorities are underrepresented in the sciences. He ultimately wants to become a neurosurgeon and entrepreneur. In University City, Ashley Johnson, Channel 6 Action News. So we are really um, uh, proud of Yaya for getting that um, publicity, but we've had a number of uh, excellent um, students from the biomedical technician training program and um, now the biomedical research technician uh, apprenticeship um, make important contributions um, to research while they've been in our uh, education and training programs at Wistar. So I don't think I have to introduce all of you to the uh, SARS-CoV-2 um, pandemic. Um, I should be asking you um, what you know about it since we've all been um, living through this uh, um, kind of a amazing time in history. Um, but uh, you may or may not know about different approaches to developing vaccines. Okay, so um, traditional approaches, um, like what they mentioned with um, uh, Wistar, uh, uh, contributing to the development of the rubella and rabies viruses. Um, that tends to be work with uh, either killed um, or attenuated weakened versions of viruses um, that are used uh, to um, uh, you know, create immunity in individuals. Um, there are newer techniques that involve um, either viral vectors or um, nucleic acids, DNA and RNA, and more specifically, the uh, Pfizer and uh, Moderna vaccines, which were the first given um, uh, authorized emergency use by the FDA to fight COVID-19. Um, they were RNA vaccines, and now the um, Johnson & Johnson one dose and the Oxford uh, AstraZeneca um, uh, vaccine that has been um, in the news recently is it seeks emergency authorization approval um, are viral vector based. Okay, so they all have um, the same idea of creating um, Im Im immunity against that disease and immune response against um, the particular di disease, in this case, the virus uh, that causes COVID-19, SARS-CoV-2. So um, at Wistar, um, Yaya mentioned that he works in uh, the Weiner lab. David Weiner was really a pioneer in the um, DNA vaccine uh, field. So um, some of the pros for DNA vaccines is that unlike the um, 
RNA vaccines that need to be kept cold. The DNA vaccines are temperature stable. Um, they've been shown to be safe and immunogenic. Um, they are easy to design. I'll talk about how quickly Wistar moved our um, candidate into the clinic. Um, they can really be used to deliver anything that you can encode in DNA um, and uh, boostable. So when we're hearing about, you know, variations and um, not knowing how long uh, immunity might last, uh, DNA vaccines, um, you know, could be given uh, to give a boost or perhaps slightly change the immune response to recognize a new variant of the virus. Um, some cons, it requires you to know the sequence of your antigen or protein or part of your virus um, that you want to develop the immunity against. Um, and it may be less immunogenic than um, uh, protein or um, other uh, approaches. Um, but uh, as we've seen with the um, Pfizer and Moderna vaccines with RNA, um, the nucleic acids have been uh, really effective in um, preventing severe disease and definitely hospitalization. So this is an image of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Um, it's got a spike protein you may have heard about on the outside. And so um, that spike uh, protein, um, the Weiner lab, um, when they learned the sequence, they actually uh, made the um, insert of DNA and put it into a plasmid or vector. Um, and that plasmid DNA that contains um, sequence that encodes the uh, spike protein um, is uh, injected into um, muscle cells and then um, creates an immune response for both uh, T cells and B cells to recognize um, the spike protein on SARS-CoV-2 virus to um, you know, prevent people from being uh, infected or at least to prevent um, them from getting really sick from that viral infection. So um, the uh, uh, sequence was released from uh, Wuhan in January of 2020. And immediately upon release, the uh, team from Wistar and Inovio started working on creating that DNA vaccine against these spike protein from SARS-CoV-2. Um, and they uh, uh, advanced that from, from the day the sequence was released um, into the clinic in uh, 11 weeks. So this is a Nature Communications article um, uh, reporting that and some of the ind individuals from the um, Inovio uh, pharmaceutical company in King of Prussia and our Worcester Vaccine and Immunotherapy um, Center that contributed to that work. Um, and again, David Weiner's uh, lab um, really pioneered DNA vaccine technology and um, he is the head of our vaccine and immunotherapy center at Wistar. One of the reasons um, uh, Wistar's team was so poised to respond to uh, the, the COVID pandemic was that we had previously um, used DNA vaccines, developed DNA vaccines um, against a Ebola, and we were able to advance that into the clinic in 15 months. Um, uh, MERS, which is um, another coronavirus uh, related to um, SARS, so MERS, Middle Eastern Respiratory um, Syndrome. Um, we advanced that into the clinic in nine months, and then uh, Zika, um, carried by mosquitoes, was advanced into the clinic in 6.5 months. So with these emerging diseases, we've sort of been um, getting better at uh, increasing how quickly we can respond and create a, um, a vaccine and get that vaccine being tested in the clinic. Um, so this is a little bit about, uh, again, some, some differences between um, uh, DNA and RNA vaccines, but the premise is the same, right? Both the uh, Pfizer and Moderna vaccines, as well as um, our vaccine candidates, DNA candidates from Wistar, um, you know, rely on um, this sequence of the spike protein um, being cloned. It actually has to be cloned into DNA. Um, to either make our DNA vaccine or um, to produce the uh, RNA that's used in the RNA vaccines. Um, and again, in, in both cases, those uh, uh, nucleic acids are injected um, into cells and then the cells are gonna um, produce the, uh, if it's DNA, the RNA, um, and in both cases, uh, the protein 
um, that's going to look like a part of the SARS-CoV-2 virus so that um, our immune system can learn how to recognize it. And uh, this is a picture of the, the spike protein um, being expressed in, uh, in cells. So um, in order to get uh, any type of uh, new drug, whether it's a vaccine or um, uh, a medicine, a, a drug into um, human testing, you need to go through preclinical testing. And so with SARS, uh, um, DNA vaccine against SARS-CoV-2 was tested in uh, mice, um, guinea pig, um, rabbit, and also a macaque, um, a non-human primate. And um, you know was shown to be uh, safe and effective, and so it advanced into um, human clinical trials. Uh, this is the principal investigator of the uh, uh, the study, the clinical trial um, being conducted um, at Penn, um, as well as at um, uh, the uh, an institution in uh, Kansas City and the University of Kentucky. Um, and it is currently uh, in a phase two, three um, clinical trial. And although it probably won't be used in the United States because um, you know, we now probably have enough of the uh, Pfizer and Moderna and Johnson and Johnson vaccines to cover all adults in the US, um, it definitely because it is um, temperature stable and doesn't need that refrigeration, um, may play a role in less developed parts of the world and being able to um, you know, have their populations vaccinated against SARS-CoV-2 as well. Um, and then one of the last things I wanted to leave you on is, you know, again, we are all experiencing history, uh, living through a pandemic, um, but I think you know, important lessons to take away um, is how can we be more prepared um, for the next, uh, you know, potential uh, pandemic. So this slide shows, um, and it's actually modified from uh, the now famous uh, Tony Fauci uh, from a paper that uh, Dr. Fauci wrote um, about all of these um, emerging uh, and re-emerging infectious diseases around the world. And, you know, by advancing um, the technology for vaccines, it really does help us to, you know, respond faster. And obviously, you know, we, we, we got faster with e each outbreak, but um, to be able to, uh, you know, respond um, quickly in order to prevent the next pandemic. So I am happy to take um, any questions. Um, about either my own career path or any um, anything about the Wistar Institute. Thanks, Christy. Um, appreciate all the background you gave as to different career possibilities in the biomedical science field, specifically your path and some of the um, educational opportunities or requirements that one must go through. Um, you know, I think I think that most likely was very insightful for the students. So students, I don't wanna talk anymore. I would actually like to open this up. We do have officially three minutes left. Um, I'm happy to stay on. I'm not sure if uh, Dr. Shooter McGuire is happy to stay on for a few extra minutes to answer some questions, but please um, you know, don't hesitate to speak up and ask your questions. I also wanted to just quickly mention that in your chat box, I put the YouTube channel um, up so you can copy that and go to that. And as I mentioned, this one, as well as Many of the other ones, if I remember to record them, will be posted on there in the very near future. So you can go back and, and obtain additional information that way. So questions. Um, I was interested when you brought up like the student programs at Wistar and uh, you talked about the high school fellowship program. And I was just wondering like, uh, when would that occur? What would it entail? And is there like an application process I would need to go through? Yeah, great, great question. So um, uh, I, I don't remember what, what school that you said you're from, but predominantly we recruit for that program for students in the school district of Philadelphia. Um, we are looking to uh, expand that, um, but that's where we are right now. And in fact, unfortunately we had to cancel a program 
um, last summer in 2020, um, as well as this summer in 2021. So we will hope to get back to that in the summer of 2022. And if you go on uh, Wistar's website, you can find um, more information um, about the application and really, you know, what what uh, what students are eligible. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, in your experience, uh, do you believe that the undergraduate school that you go to affects your career, like, greatly? Because I'm, like, I'm in the college process right now, and it's really stressful, you know, because you see these, like, Ivy Leagues and stuff. I was just wondering if uh, that, like, truly affects where, the, where you go with the rest of your life. Um, I think you need to go in the place where you are going to have the best fit, right? So you want to choose the place that's the best fit for you, where you can really excel and the place that's going to allow you to get to the next step. Um, so certainly, you know, if you want to go to medical school, um, going to a more prestigious uh, college or university helps, but only if you do really well at that prestigious college or university. Um, you know, I think there are some other things to, um, to look at. One of those is uh, opportunities for undergraduates to get involved in research. So, um, and you get, it's great that you're already thinking about programs for high school students. Um, you know, there are, you know, some programs for high school students out there, but there are a lot more programs across the country for undergraduate students. So, um, you know, you really want to look uh, if you're going to be a science major, that's one of the questions you want to be asking is what opportunities are there for undergraduates um, to participate in research, because whether you want to go into a uh, science path or you want to go in um, uh, to, to medical school or a health professions, that research experience is um, really valuable. So a plug, since somebody said they were going to Rowan, and I know it was for uh, education and not for science, um, but that was one of the things I loved at Rowan. Um, and I started an office of uh, undergraduate research at Rowan um, with, to really try to connect uh, undergraduate students with research opportunities. I would like to jump in only because a personal experience um, for that student, and I know he's not from Gateway, but uh, we're all a team here, right? Actually, I love, David, that we have students from Delaware, PA, and Jersey on here. I think that's great. Um, and I would love, Christy, for them to open up the applications for high school because we run an internship program. And already we have students on Penn's campus at Penn Vet Working Dog Center and at the archaeology, uh, the museum for archaeology. So it would be cool to have another STEM one. But um, yeah, my son went to Penn State and I do believe, and I didn't know this before, he was a material science engineer. He's now in England at Cambridge for the Marie Curie Foundation, but it's because he had international professors who he got involved in research at undergrad. So to answer that student's question, it is important to go to a school that has research and not only research, but has professors that are internationally known for what they do. And I know Rowan does as well, but it just expands your opportunities. But you gotta be the kind of student that's gonna to go to the office hours and that's gonna make relationships with the professors and take advantage of the opportunities. But definitely, I didn't think about that before, but the big schools sort of Rutgers and Penn State and, and, and uh, Rowan now is known as a leading research school have those opportunities that some of the other schools don't. Yeah, I just wanna jump in Sorry, Diego, I think you unmuted yourself. If, if you wanted to comment on that, go ahead. I, I just wanted to say thank you for the responses. Yeah, Super helpful. yeah no problem. And, and I'm gonna just chime in with my two cents because I know a lot of students, um, those of you that, that don't know me, I was also, I am a scientist. I also did research similar to Dr. Shudo McGuire. Um, and I left doing the research and now my job is to talk about the research as the Director of Outreach, Outreach and Education for PSBR. And so I see this question a lot. I get this, I get this question a lot. I, I interact with students a lot. And I, I know students put a lot of pressure on themselves um, to get into the best program, to get into the best school, whether that's self-imposed pressure, whether that's societal pressure, whether that's family pressure. Um, I really like Dr. Shooter McGuire's um, response in that you should really pick a school that you feel comfortable with. I went to um, what I considered a great school. It is a small, liberal arts college 
Um, it is not in the top 100 schools of the country. I looked the other day, actually, I just happened to stumble upon a list, um, but it gave me a great education and uh, it was a smaller school. I felt very comfortable there and it allowed me to expand myself and uh, develop my leadership skills. And with that said, uh, when, I, when I was graduating college, I also thought I was going to be a medical doctor, um, like many of us do. And I too got sucked into the, the allure of scientific research and those big why questions. Um, but before I made my decision to simply do biomedical science, I was actually admitted into and accepted an MD PhD program, which are very prestigious programs around the country. And I'm not saying that to pat myself on the back. I'm saying that to say I went to a school that I felt most comfortable with. My mom actually found the school by watching Jeopardy. It was college Jeopardy. And there was a pre-med student on Jeopardy who was doing well. So she wrote it down. And literally, that's how I ended up with my undergrad in my, as an undergrad at that school. Um, but even with that background and a college that wasn't even in the top 100, I got into four MD, PhD programs around the country. So it's what you make of it. It's, it's you developing yourself, feeling comfortable in your, in your environment and developing yourself as a leader, as a scientist, as whatever it is that you're going after. So I hope that helps. Yeah, and we're, we're probably preaching to the choir because all of you are taking advantage of this opportunity to be on a, uh, a, a webinar this afternoon. Um, but that's really what it's all about, right? So going to a place that has those opportunities, but then you really taking advantage of those opportunities and you know growing and excelling in them. So we're five minutes over. I understand if, if everybody has to leave or anybody wants to leave, but if you have additional questions for um, anybody on the panel, um, including, and most importantly, Dr. Trudy McGuire, please, please stay on and ask them. I see panels falling off. I guess there were no questions. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for joining us. I just had one more question, if no one else had a question. No, great, Diego, go ahead. Um, so if we're looking to get into like, I'm not asking this from an admission standpoint, but just because I want experience into like a medical field. Um, are there any advice? Is there any advice that you have on how to gain experience or how to gain a network in high school that can carry out into college? Like a shadowing or fellowship or like an internship? Like, is there any, any advice there? So what year did you say? Are you a senior? I'm a junior. Junior. Okay. So um, Children's Hospital of Philadelphia has uh, programs for high school students and undergraduate students where you get the double experience. You get um, placed in a lab, but you also get one day of shadowing. Um, I think that their programs might also be on hold this summer, um, but it's definitely something to look into for next year. Um, you know, so that's Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, CHOP. Um, and what else is I going to say? Some other advice. Um, you Christy, know, if I could just jump in quickly. Uh, yeah, you know, I'll, 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 one thing I thought, I thought of it, dude. So, um, I, because I thought I wanted to be a pediatrician, I reached out to my own pediatrician and actually, you know, shadowed him a couple of days as a high school student. And again, it might be difficult right now with all of the restrictions for COVID, um, but, you know, try to use uh, your own network, right? You've been to doctors, any doctors that you've been to, you know, reach out. And um, this is where David and I usually tell students to like cast a big net right? Contact as many people as you can, and hopefully you get something back. And if you don't, just keep trying. Yeah, sorry. I was just going to say that, that, you know, if you look online, um, again, due to COVID, we are in a, in, in, in a difficult situation here. But, you know, I don't have them off the top of my head, but I always hear about internships or, or summer camps, summer programs in the Philadelphia area. Um, so if you just did, you know, a quick Google search or a, a little bit of homework, you might be able to find some. Some of them are complimentary. Some of them you might have to pay for. Some of them might be a week long. Some of them might be an entire summer program. Um, but I think many programs do exist. Um, and cast that net. You know, I, I spoke to somebody who just graduated from college yesterday who was doing just informal interviews and wanted to do more information. He had no, no desire necessarily to do biomedical science. He was an entrepreneur business person. But, you know, don't be afraid to talk to people. The more people you talk with, 
you know, oftentimes then it, it, it could lead to something down the road. Thank you. Just as, a, as, as another quick example, Mrs. Eckstein's, um, you know, she reached out to me. We developed this, this, this internship style webinar program because we can't do on-site internships this year. It turned out that we're, I'm, I'm having a great time with her students. Obviously now there are, are, are other students like yourself, Diego and Rachel jumping on. Um, but a couple of her students are actually working with me through PSBR to develop slightly broader programs that are going to incorporate other aspects of their interests in biomedical science. So, you know, if that's something you're interested in, obviously you can feel free to reach out to me, but you also can reach out to maybe an organization around your geographic location to say, hey, I'm interested in helping out as a volunteer. Can I develop a program for you? And that's also going to do a lot of things for you. It's going to get you involved. It's going to show leadership. It's going to be able to, hopefully somebody will mentor you. Um, but, you know, just by using some initiative, you can really start carving out your own programs as well. Diego, I don't know if you saw the chat and where you are, but all the hospitals have a volunteer tab. And my students have worked at Nemours DuPont, Inspira, Bayada, and Jefferson. So all your major hospitals around you should have some volunteer form. And you might have to get TB shots and things like that. My students had to do that, but in a year that's not COVID, they've had a good experiences there. Cool. Thank you guys so much. Of course, thanks for coming on. Well, thank you, Christy. This was this was awesome. Thanks, Rachel, Melissa. Did, did nice you have a question? Meet you and oh, I no, might sorry. have to reach out someday for uh, um, my, my at ten. My daughter wants to go to Penn State already, so you know we might be reaching out for. I'll tell you, my son. Like, and you know, I'm from Jersey, so to go to Penn State was like you know, a huge deal, but material science and engineering is rare. He would have had to go to like California, Arizona or whatever. And I had to fight my ex-husband because he wanted him to go. He got free, you know, he was number four in the class. So he could have gone to community college, but I'm like, no, he's engineer, but I'll tell you, he's the only American that's working on this huge um, project with the Marie Curie foundation. They're making like an artificial brain and uh, he's making like, to your point, David, from earlier, he's making a ton of money as a post, he's in a doctorate program. He's getting his doctorate for free at Cambridge. Um, so, I mean, and he wouldn't have had it. He worked with the scientist at Penn State, two scientists. One's internationally known for ceramics and they were creating a battery for Tesla. He was on that project as well as like Dr. Susan, someone, she worked on the, um, she's famous. She made the glass for the telescope that they found life on Mars for. And mm -hmm. that's the one that reached out to him and got him this opportunity. So mm -hmm. I do think it's, it's like, I located, it's like when, it was at one o'clock. Remember Dr. Purdy sent Purdy. You did. <laughs> so yeah, I have a lot to say positive about Penn State. It was a little more money for us, but he's got loans. Good to have some skin in the game though. Keeps you honest. Rachel, I think I saw you unmute yourself. Did you have a question before or? No, I was just saying thank you. Okay. Just wanted to make sure I didn't miss you. Thanks thank for joining you, us today. Yeah, it's, you stepped it up, David. We got the Tri-County represented. Yeah, giddy up. That's great. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's my pleasure. Thanks to everybody for joining Great. us. And uh, maybe we'll see everybody on, some of you, hopefully we'll see you on Friday as well. Thank you. Take care. Have Bye. a great day. Thanks. Thanks, Christy. Anytime, David. Bye.